Okay. Do you want to scoot over? And then just be careful we don't knock the table too much. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> we have a viewer, which is great. Um, so we'll just give it one more minute, and then we'll get started. Okay. Should we start? Sure. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone to our first webinar in a series of four about School Grown. Uh, so we're just going to share um, how our program works, how everything sort of happens, what we do, and what we've learned over the past couple of years. Um, we get a lot of requests from people who want to do a similar type of program or do some part of what we do in their own community. So we're hoping to share our lessons and what we've tried and any resources that we have so that you can do what you want where you are as well, which would be great. Um, so I'm Katie. I'm Callie. Uh, and we're going to walk you through today's session, which is about uh, youth writing curriculum. Um, so what I'm going to do is share my screen with you so that we can share some um, slides and images that we've prepared for you. So that should show up, yep, on your screen. Um, one thing I wanted to say is if anything comes up for you, you can use the question um, and answer box uh, to ask us questions. And you can also, we'll put this up in a minute, but you can email sufian at foodshare.net um, and he can help you sort of get connected or you can ask questions through him um, or through Twitter as well. But we'll get going. It's also being recorded um, so we can, uh, post it online and you can watch it if you have to leave at any time or if you get disconnected or something. So here we go. Um, today's session is about students as curriculum writers. So we want to share with you um, the process that we took to write curriculum for... Well, first of all, these are our lovely students <laughs> um, from last summer. And this is from one of our field trips um, to Black Creek Community Farm. I'm just going to make this a little bit smaller so that you can see everything at once. Okay, can go for it. Sure, so we'll start with the agenda. Um, our agenda today is how our program works, an intro to school growing, youth writing curriculum and why, youth writing curriculum and how, farming curriculum process, food justice curriculum process, and at the end we'll have a question and answer. So we'll share, um, we use two different ways of, that's the next one, um, just so you flip them. We'll share the two different processes that we use to write curriculum. We did one for more of our farming focused stuff and then one for food justice. So we'll walk you through how both of those work. Um, but first, um, a few notes. Um, if you're using Google+, Plus, uh, you can use the Q&A to ask a question. You can ask a question anytime um, and it'll pop up over there and then we might just save it. Um, towards the end, but you can just ask them at any time and they'll come our way. Uh, you can also email questions to Sufian at fushar.net um, and he'll make sure that we get them. Um, you might not be able to ask a question if you're not on Google Plus and that's why you have the option of emailing in your question. And you can also tweet uh, your question um, to uh, foodshare.to and Sufian will get it to us. Um, and it's also being recorded. Um, so if you have to leave at any point in time, that's okay. Um, we'll post it up on YouTube and you'll be able to watch it there as well. So Sufian is your friend in this scenario. Anytime that we start any sort of activity, um, we usually do an icebreaker. So this picture is from, where's this picture from? Uh, Bendo, the front of Bendo BTI. And this was from our first day. So you'll see, what you'll see is students from East Dale in the middle, students from Bendel on the outside, and we do a concentric circle thing and people ask questions. So we thought Callie and I would do model an icebreaker for you. Um, so, uh, and we try and make our icebreakers be about 
food when we can, just as because we find food is a way to sort of connect people. Um, so, Callie, what icebreaker questions do you want to ask me? Um, what's your favorite restaurant and why? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, okay, right now, I think my favorite restaurant is, um, oh my gosh, I have so many to pick. I think Dos in the Hall because it's close to where I work and it's um, an incredible price point and the food is always so good and the people are super kind and I love it there. Okay, I'm going to ask you if you could only eat one thing or I know that you'll probably pick two things because I know you so well, but if you could pick two things to eat for the rest of your life, what would they be? Um, like everyone knows, it would probably be pickles and shrimp. Pickles and shrimp. are my two favorite foods. That's great. <laughs> okay, so just a bit of an icebreaker for you. Um, so up next, Callie is going to talk about um, a little bit about our program here at School Grown. So take it away, Callie. Um, so School Grown is ran by Katie and Food Share. Um, Katie hires 14 students, seven students from Eastdale and seven students from Benzo to help grow on the school farms. Um, it also, you can also get two co-op credits throughout the summer um, while working a full-time paid job. And it's also a great way to make new friends and meet new people. So our first farmer site is at East Oak Collegiate, that's at Broadview and Gerard. We farm on the rooftop. It used to be a tennis court. Um, now we have raised beds on it. I think there's around 200 raised beds with um, a bunch of different vegetables and fruits. We also... Oh yeah, you going to Bendo? Oh yeah, here's just some pictures. That's what it looks like up on the roof. It's pretty nice and green and lush. And then this is our second site. So we also go at Bendo BTI. This is located at Midland and Lawrence. We grow in the front of the school and we also grow in the back of the school. So this is the back. In the back of the school, we usually grow zucchinis and tomato plants just because we have the trellises for the vines to grow up. Oh, there we go. I'm going to make one pile. Sorry, I'm just talking to Kelly. I'm going to make one pile so it's less confusing. We're getting our papers all confused. <laughs> okay, take it away. <laughs> so we're on this one. Yeah. So, okay. Okay, um, we hire, like I said, 14 um, students from each school to become farmers. We, we get full-time jobs plus two credits if you want to take that option. We, uh, yeah, and the jobs are you can work on, um, uh, as Callie said, during the summer. We also do after-school jobs, like during the school year. And then uh, sometimes, depending on funding, we also do March break. We sell our produces to restaurants. Um, some of the restaurants we sold to were George Brown College um, and Burdock. We've sold to a couple other restaurants, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also sell at farmers markets. So one is at Woodbine, near Woodbine Station, and the other one is at um, like Bathurst. Yeah. Kind of. um, and then we also sell food uh, just to folks in the neighborhood sometimes. So this is a mom um, who would come and pick up her son at the driveway of Bendale. Um, and one day she was like, what do you got there? Carrots? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And so we sold her some carrots just like from the driveway. So then we started like a veggie drive through. So in the summer, uh, neighbors and stuff would roll through and buy some stuff. And the picture on the right is um, like a teacher CSA that we did or a harvest share. Um, so the, the business class, the marketing class made posters and they advertised um, a harvest share and sold it to the teachers. They collected the money and handled all the money. And the horticulture class and our youth staff like Callie um, helped to harvest and pack the shares and things like that. We also do cooking classes at Eastdale. We learn how to cook with the food and produce that we grow. We learn how to cook from scratch and new recipes. 
we also so some of the places we went was to Black Farm Creek. Oh yeah, Black Creek Community Farm. Yeah. Um, that's in the West End. Um, we also do food workshops, food justice workshops, and learn how the food system runs and what's wrong with our food systems. <laughs> Um, so we thought this would be a good time. So Callie, although she's so modest, um, has worked with us for two full summers and she's applying for another job as a crew leader this year. Um, also shout out to Callie. She just got into three colleges <laughs> and she gets to pick the one she wants. But we thought if Callie could say a little bit about, um, what School Grown has meant to her just working with us for the past little while. Um, so school growing has meant a lot to me. It's obviously taught me a lot of things that I never knew or never thought I would learn throughout my life. Um, I, lot, I met a lot of new people from school and from other schools, some people that I've seen around but never got a chance to talk to. Um, it taught me about willpower and not giving up because there'd be days that not everyone gets along and It'd be really hot out, but you always need to get the job done and just stay positive. Um, it taught me to be a lot more outgoing because I'm usually quiet into myself. And I learn more about myself and the type of things I could do and the type of things I like to do. Um, so that's a bit about just like school grown in general. Um, it tells you a bit about how our program works and the kinds of things that we do. Um, but Callie and I thought it would be good to give you um, some more information of uh, the context of young people in the city. So um, one thing we want to highlight right now is that um, the unemployment rate in the city of Toronto is around 7.5%. Um, that's like the average for the city. But if you kind of focus in on the unemployment rate in Toronto for young people, so these are people who are actively looking for work and cannot find a job. Um, between the ages of 15 to 24, the unemployment rate is 18%, which is double um, what it is when you take the city as a whole. Um, and if you focus in a little further, um, for Aboriginal youth, it's 35%. For racialized youth, it's 33 And for newcomer youth, it's 33% as well. So that tells us that there's a bit of a crisis. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> um, and it also kind of gives you a lens as to why we do the work that we do and why we choose um, as often as we can to make our work about hiring young people and giving paid positions to young people. Um, and also using an equity-based approach to say who are the people that need us the most at this moment when we look at these statistics that helps us make our choices. Um, in Toronto also, it's interesting to take that same sort of lens um, uh, for zooming in on things like graduation rates. So we work with the Toronto District School Board. We're really happy to. <laughs> They're great partners for us. Um, right now, the graduation rate is about around 80%, right? 78%, which is pretty good um, relative to what it is in other places and relative to what it has been here in Toronto. But if you focus in, for black youth, it's 64%, and for Latino youth, it's 69 um, For students who are in the academic stream, it's higher than the, the average sort of graduation rate overall. But for students who are focused into applied, which overwhelmingly is racialized youth, um, it's only 59 And that's a real yeah. issue. <laughs> that's like a big problem in our city. Um, this statistic was really interesting. So for students who have all of their eight credits by the end of grade nine, 58% um, of them eventually go on to university. Um, but for students who finish grade nine behind, if they have fewer than six credits, uh, the percentage of them that actually go on to university, which is supposed to be a chance at a better job, a better wage, um, it's only 2%. So that tells us that there's like uh, a need to make sure that if we have the ability to hire people, if we can pay people to work at our farm, that the equity-based approach, um, the thing that's gonna actually move us towards something like social justice and food justice is to focus on those issues are. Um, and to be clear that the need isn't necessarily innate in those youth, it's in the system. The system isn't serving these people in the same way that it could and that it should. Um, and that's important about a gap in achievement like if you look at that it looks like the graduation rates are different 
<laughs> but what we want to make sure people understand is that the gap isn't in achievement. The gap is in our expectations. Um, so Joan Cohn is a teacher who works in California. Um, she teaches English. And in her school, they had AP, you know, advanced placement English, had sort of a regular track English, college level English, um, and then remedial English. Um, and she said that one day she looked out at all of the courses offered in her school and noticed that all of the racialized students were in the remedial or basic level class and all of the AP classes were white students. Um, and so what she decided to do as an experiment, understanding that that's not because of those abilities of those students, but maybe there's an issue with the system, is she de-streamed the entire English department. Um, and she just offered English and purposefully mixed together students who had been streamed into AP um, and, and streamed into regular and streamed into basic or remedial. Um, and what happened is the graduation rates across all demographics went up. Um, and so part of it is to say that if we expect students to only be in a remedial class or in a basic level class that they might perform only to that level and that what we need to do is actually address the way that the system views young people. Um, so to expand on that a little bit, and I use achievement gap in quotes, <laughs> um, but like precisely because it is this issue with the broader system and how that system is sort of entrenched with things like racism. Um, I wanted to tell you about a, a study that was done by Steele, um, and you can also read about it in Lisa Delpit's book. Um, and what they did is they had black and white college students take the same standardized test. So what I'm about to say, you have to stay with me. <laughs> you can't end at the next point. You have to go to the point after that. Um, so when those students, a diverse group of students, were told nothing about their abilities before they took the test. So for example, the instructor says, you have 45 minutes to take this test. A racial gap in performance um, emerged with white students outperforming uh, black students. But this is the big important point. Take this point. <laughs> um, when the students in the room were told that this test is a diagnostic tool to see how people who are already determined to have strong, strong language skills solve linguistic problems, the gap was eliminated. So when this group of students were told everyone in this room is already good <laughs> at language skills and is already determined to do well in this test, and the test is just to see how you, how you manage these questions, um, the gap was eliminated. So that tells us that the gap isn't in those students' ability to achieve. It has to do with our expectations. And the same thing happened uh, with a math test that was given to um, a diverse group of genders. And so when they said nothing about the test before the test except just write this math test, um, a gendered gap emerged. And when they said men and women typically score similarly on this test and here's your test, um, the gendered gap was eliminated. Um, and so what that is, is called stereotype threat. Um, it's an experience of anxiety or concern when someone is put in a situation um, where they have their performance has the potential to confirm a negative stereotype about the group with which they belong. So part of what we're trying to do at School Grown and in all our education programs is to be intentional and deliberate and explicit in trying to disrupt things like stereotype threat. So our work is about positioning students as experts, um, positioning them as intelligent, as capable, as knowledgeable, um, and expecting that out of them because they are. <laughs> um, and part of that meant when we had the opportunity to write curriculum, we hired them as curriculum writers. So today we talk about youth as <laughs> curriculum writers. So we need to look at curriculum a little bit first. Um, fundamentally, like when you break it down in curriculum theory, like writing curriculum is to address the question of what should be taught. It's deciding what should be in your course, <laughs> um, what content should be in your school, uh, what you need to learn to, at the end of this course, have someone say, yep, you learned what you needed to learn. <laughs> you met all of the curriculum objectives, right? So that means that a curriculum writer has the power to name what people need to know. Um, they get to name what knowledge and skills are valuable enough to be seen as necessary to be learned by others. So to write curriculum is to have a lot of power. You're deciding what's important and what's not important and what is necessary for other people to do. 
Um, so we don't want to ignore that power. We want to acknowledge that power and then also shift that power. So around the same time that we were thinking we need to have a curriculum for our program, um, we got some funding, which was incredible. We were really excited about that. One way that we could have done this is just I sit in a room by myself <laughs> at my desk and I decide what school grown could be and what the curriculum should be. Um, but around that time, um, I encountered this quote by Audrey and Rich that says, when those who have the power to name and to socially construct reality choose not to see you or hear you, when someone with the authority of a teacher, say, describes the world and you are not in it, there is a moment of psychic disequilibrium and it is as though you looked in the mirror and saw nothing. So what does it mean when someone with the authority of a teacher names the world, also known as <laughs> writes curriculum, right? Decides what in the world is important and valuable and needs to be learned by others. Um, what happens when they do that and they create something that does not reflect you? Um, it's as though you look in a mirror and saw nothing. Um, so that really started to shape how we were going to try and write curriculum for our program. This idea of a mirror also really resonates with this quote from Juno Diaz. And I know it's a lot of quotes, but these are really what ground the whole point of what we're doing. Um, and so what Juno Diaz says is that if you want to make a human being a monster, deny them at the cultural level any reflection of themselves. So again, we're speaking to the idea of looking in a mirror and seeing nothing. So he says, growing up, I felt like a monster in some ways. I didn't see myself reflected at all. It was like, is something wrong with me? The whole society seems to think that people like me don't exist. And part of what inspired me as an author uh, was this deep desire that before I died, I would make a couple of mirrors. And I would make some mirrors so that kids like me might see themselves reflected back and might not feel so monstrous for it. So part of our process for hiring students and how we were gonna actually do this work together was about creating a curriculum that acted as a mirror for the students that we work with, for the city that we're in, um, and that sort of broke that gap between uh, the way curriculum is currently written and what it is reflective of. Because right now we would say it is reflective of something and it's reflective of a really white experience. Um, so in Toronto, the proportion of white students in the TDSB is 28%, uh, um, but the proportion of white teachers is 70%, which isn't necessarily a balance. And so what does it mean to have racialized students, which is around 70% of the student population is racialized, come to a school in which what is reflected back to them is perhaps a white teacher, perhaps a white curriculum, a white institution, <laughs> like all kinds, and they don't have their culture reflected. They don't have their lived experience reflected um, and, and maybe not valued. And so part of what we wanted to do is make sure that we were making mirrors with our curriculum and that I can't make that mirror. <laughs> I need to involve students in that process. Um, this is our last little piece of like theory, but the reason that we would want to involve students um, is because of this idea of epistemic privilege. And that idea is that People who face marginalization um, have a unique access to knowledge about how the systems of power operate. So if you face racism, you probably have a unique uh, positionality in which you know about systems of racism because you've been receiving them, right? Um, uh, same thing goes for gender, for age. So if we understand that youth face marginalization, we also know that they have knowledge about that marginalization because of their position. They know quite a lot <laughs> about how systems of power operate because they are in that system experiencing um, the effects of it every day. Um, and so what Moya and others say is that acknowledging epistemic privilege isn't just like a nice thing to do. Um, it's not just like a kind pedagogical decision. Um, it's actually necessary for political struggle. Um, so the whole point is that youth have unique sources of knowledge about how the world works, um, and we need to value that knowledge if we're serious about creating social change. Okay, so then <laughs> we hired some students <laughs> to uh, write some curriculum. So now we're going to tell you um, how we went about doing that.
Um, so we hired, uh, we hired how many? Ten. Yeah, ten students. Callie was one of them. So Callie wrote the curriculum that you are all welcome to download and use. <laughs> she is your curriculum author. Um, ten students, and we worked over three days. They were paid fifteen dollars an hour. Um, they were paid for their work. Um, and the first thing we did was actually read um, a large chunk of this book um, by Paula Freer called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, and Callie and I were just talking before this, this is like the most stolen book um, in public libraries in the world. That's what I've heard um, because it's supposed to be so revolutionary. And it really is. And so if you're interested in these ideas of, of relationships between students and teachers and curriculum and how to actually address power um, in those situations and how to use education as a way to get towards social justice and social change, I'd recommend this book. Um, anyways, we read a part that was about the banking model of education, um, which essentially, Paula Freire argues that education has become simply an act of depositing, um, where students are depositories and teachers are depositors, and that's the only action. So uh, what he says is to turn students into containers or into receptacles, um, and they are to be filled by the teachers. And the more completely that teacher fills them, the better teacher they are. And the more meekly the receptacles permit themselves to be filled, the better students they are. Um, so we read this out loud as a group, and uh, people weren't happy about it. <laughs> Um, and so, oh, one thing I should tell you is that we recorded our work. So we do have some quotes from when, like, students were working together. And so this is what um, students said. So, Callie, do you want to tell us what, what was people's response to that idea? So I guess because we are the students, not, um, it wasn't a very positive response because, well, that's not how we think about our system, that we aren't just empty buckets. We're more than that. I feel disappointed that people think that of us. I think everyone has their own. I mean, people really know a lot. People aren't just empty, you know? They have things they learn from their parents, from living in this world. We aren't just empty. Yeah, and so I think what we talked about as a group is that um, many students that they had experienced that at school, like that was a common experience that they were supposed to just show up and memorize and leave, but that they didn't like that. <laughs> um, and that they didn't feel heard or feel valued. And so we started talking about empty bucket education, like from the first hour to this day, <laughs> talk about empty buckets and like when people's buckets are full and how they're already full. Um, so Callie actually made this, um, Callie and one of our other students, Caitlin, made this for our presentation um, to reflect this idea of like the empty bucket. So do you want to explain this? Um, sure. So as you can see, we have two pictures, one of an empty bucket and one as a full bucket. So the empty bucket is how the education system sees us as we have no knowledge or we don't know anything yet, we're just fresh minds, but we see ourselves as full buckets. We write in our own curriculum is about getting the education system to see us how we see ourselves. So that sort of framed um, the work that we were doing. Uh, this is another slide that Callie made about um, about curriculum, so you want to tell us that? Um, so usually when a curriculum is written, it's written by adults. If students write it, it gives us a chance to speak about what we want to know and what we would like to learn. We should be able to learn what we want to learn, not what other people think we should learn. Students writing a curriculum is also, also shows that we are as experts in things we already know. Um, so this idea that like students are already experts, um, was really important to us. Um, everyone, in addition to that, that we had uh, hired um, to write curriculum had worked with us for at least one summer. Um, some students too, because we do, um, students can reapply to be a, a leadership student where they're like a peer mentor for the new students. Um, so some had worked with us for two years. Um, but I think that that's also very important when we're talking about food. Because um, often when we talk about food education, it's about filling a gap or like teaching people about food or giving them knowledge that they don't already have. Um, and it's important, uh, and in our work, we take this perspective that people already know a lot about food. We might just not value what they know about food. Um, and so having students come in and write a curriculum that was about farming and they had already spent a year farming, so they knew what needed, what other students needed to know to be successful at their job. Um, but the other part of it was like 
acknowledging that by the time students get to school, they know a lot about food. <laughs> like they're not empty when they're coming. Um, and what it usually means is that we just have some value judgments about what type of food knowledge is important or considered valuable, like the food guide, <laughs> right? Or a certain understanding of how food works. So that was to, to position the students as experts. So we'll tell you about two different processes <coughs> that we used for writing curriculum. One was about um, what do students need to know to be a farmer? Like, so creating a curriculum that was really about being a farmer. Um, so the way that we did that is we started by brainstorming the areas that we work in. So that meant um, the gardens, uh, the farmer's market, uh, the kitchen where we like store our food, but then also the kitchen where we do cooking classes um, and recipes. Um, and in, in groups, um, everyone made a map of that work area. So that picture that you're looking at now was a map of the compost area. Um, and once the students drew a map of that location, um, what we did is ask what matters about this map. Um, so people started to add post-it notes about what's actually important about this map from the lens of teaching someone who's working there, right? Like Someone new. Yeah, someone new is coming. What actually matters? Yeah. <laughs> like someone new is at work. What do you need to tell them that's important, either for their job safety or to be able to do the job well, um, those types of things. So as a group, they identified um, what matters about their map. Um, and then what we did is we went on tour. <laughs> so we took a tour of each location, which meant that each group um, sort of like introduced their map and talked about um, what was on it for them. But that also gave a chance for other people to add more ideas, um, for things that they thought was important to them. Mm -hmm. um, then what we did is connected um, a laptop to a projector. And we did most of our writing, like this is a sort of procedural thing, <coughs> um, excuse me, is we did almost all of our writing um, on a computer that was projected up on the wall. So as someone was typing, um, the whole room of like 11 people could watch the words like show up on the screen. Um, and that's how we did a lot of the collaborative writing because even if one person was writing in the sense of writing out the words, um, all 11 people in the room, so 10 students plus me, were able to clarify or like make a suggestion or something like that. And then what we did is took each point about what mattered and turned it into a learning expectation. So we have um, one example. Uh, so on like the Bendale map, um, someone wrote a post-it note when we said what matters about this map, like what matters about this garden for someone who's new is um, one example is someone said, well, they should know about row covers. Um, and then know about row covers, like we would type that up in Word. <laughs> and through asking questions, people saying like, well, what's missing from this point? Um, know about row covers became know about how and why to use row cover on the garden beds. For example, use the stakes to hold down each edge, bury the edges and mulch to keep the bugs out. So it became this long really, and long isn't the important part. The important part is that it was detailed um, and it was all information that the students felt was like necessary for someone to have. Um, so one, like that became one point on the curriculum document, but I would say like, six or eight people, what yeah. do you think? Like six or eight people weighed in. <laughs> and put in their input. Yeah. Because everyone, we all know about the row beds, but everyone uses them differently or thinks why we have to use them differently. Um, at first, like maybe some of the students didn't know how to use them, some of us did, but then we're like, yeah, we do know how to use them. We just didn't really think we did because we don't use them as much or we never used them before. Yes, and this is a direct quote <laughs> from Callie. So when we originally said, um, we took that post-it note that said no about row cover um, because we recorded everything because we were really interested in our conversations. Um, and also this is part of my uh, work. You can, anyways. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Callie's original response was row cover. I don't know anything about that. Like, like I don't know anything, um, even though she'd worked with us for two summers. Um, and then through our conversation, you can read through the transcript. And Callie, over the course of like a minute of having a conversation with other people, um, said that you have to use stakes to hold it down, that row cover is good for blocking the wind, um, it keeps the beds from drying out, it protects the plants from frost, it keeps the weeds out, and it keeps the bugs out. This is immediately after she said, <laughs> I don't know anything, right? <laughs> and so part of what we, um, part of the process was that uh, it sometimes it takes adults, like sometimes we think that we're convincing adults that they should listen to young people and see young people as smart. Um, but even when we started this, a lot of the youth thought like, oh, I don't, I don't know, like I can't write curriculum, I don't know enough. Um, and so part of it too is like, well, they've been growing up in this system that says you don't know enough. And so it was nice to see um, like part of the process was students realizing what they knew. So this quote is also from Kelly. Do you want to read it? This is what you said like afterwards. It's easier to write than it looks. Like I thought when we were doing it, it would be all these big words and hard stuff. And we'd have to follow what was already written. But it was the total opposite. We got to say what we know and what we knew was a lot of stuff. Yeah. So a lot, what a lot of students said was like, they're actually pretty smart. <laughs> Even if at the beginning they were like hesitant or like thought that maybe they didn't have a lot to contribute. Um, so that was pretty great. Um, one thing that we encountered, like it sounds really nice that we had like, all 11 people contribute to a sentence. Um, so we did this over the course of three days. And at the end of the first day, when I was thinking back, sort of in a facilitator role, I realized that um, every single suggestion that I made as the facilitator or as the teacher or as the employer in the group, like I am in a position of power, whether I think, um, every, every suggestion I made was accepted. So if we were talking about what word to use or like, how to frame something or whether something was worth putting in or not. Um, as a member of the writing group, I would also like weigh in. And whenever I said something, people would be like, yep, that one. <laughs> and no one would challenge it, even though they had just spent a lot of time articulating what they thought. Um, and so at the end of the first day, I thought, well, we need to figure out an actual way to have consensus. It's not enough just to say everyone's equal, everyone's voice is the same, everyone, you know, but then there was no mechanism for actually like registering that or making that effective. And so on the second day, um, we brought in this thing called fist of five. And so a five is like, so you would propose something like, what should we include a point about row cover in the curriculum, for example. Um, a five, someone would put their five, like, hand up in the air with five fingers would be like, yeah, I 1000% agree, it's an excellent idea. Um, three is like, yeah, I agree, I don't know. <laughs> One is like, uh, I, I'm okay with it happening, but I'm not all for it, but like, it can happen, sure. And a fist is like, I block it, um, no. And so, as soon as we had a way for people to block things in a vote, or at least to register, like, I'm not all for it, but I'm happy to, for the conversation to move along, um, we started to have people blocking. <laughs> Right? And so it meant that, like, um, to realize that as an ally, as an adult in the work, um, just saying, like, yeah, we're all equal doesn't ignore the fact that I'm the adult in the group. I'm also their employer. I, like, there's all types of ways that I have more power and more authority and more privilege, even if I pretend that it's not there or if I say that it's not there. Um, so we had a lot more sort of like consensus-based decision-making, but you need a tool to do that is the point. Because then people were blocking all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and then we would come back to it and whoever blocked it had to kind of like build a case and people would change their mind and some things we didn't do because more people would decide to block it. But it meant that we were having like a real conversation. Um, so that was good. Um, so that's basically how we came up with the first part, which is about like how to weed and how to water and um, what's important about farmers markets. Um, we use a separate process for the stuff that we call the food justice curriculum. Um, and this process was adapted from Paulo Freire's work. Um, he calls it uh, creating the content of an education. It's about how to create um, content or curriculum 
that emerges from the community that you're in. Rather than bringing it in from someone else or someone else's perspective, it comes from the people who are in the community and who are of the community. Um, so the first step that we did is we like sat at a table, <laughs> a big table with all of us there, um, and we just said what's an issue, um, a food issue in your community. And at first, like, did people talk right away or? No. no. <laughs> How'd it go? <laughs> um, so at first, I guess it was hard because we don't really think about food issues that are around us um, until you really get into it and really know what's wrong with not just the food issues in your community, but maybe in your home. So I find like... Oh, sorry, there's an announcement. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's lunchtime. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So okay. I find when you focus more on what's going on in your home before you do in your community, um, you have more of an input because you always know what's going on inside your home. Mm. So. Yeah, so then once people start to say like, oh, well, for me, actually this, um, it also, it sparks ideas in, in mm -hmm. people, right? In my community, or it's not like that in my community, it's like this, and so it would write a new idea. So what we did is not edit any of them. Anytime that someone had an idea, we would write it down on a card and just put the card out on the table. Um, there wasn't like a order or like a, like your turn, your turn, your turn. Um, it was just what sort of came out of that question. So the list there, um, processed foods, healthy food isn't marketed, um, those are in the students' words what they articulated as issues. There's like way more than this, <laughs> um, but we wanted to just give you an example. So um, then what we did is with all of the cards laid out on the table, we asked students to pick a card that they liked, like that they felt connected to. So it didn't have to be one that they, an idea that they came up with, but just like what's one that stands out to them. Um, and then they had the job of going out into the community, which meant for us, we were working at FoodShare. So we went into the neighborhood at FoodShare. Um, they went on their own. I didn't have to go with them. Um, so they had space and freedom to do what they wanted to do. Um, but the idea was they had to pick one issue and go take a picture that represents that issue. So it could be that they like happened upon something. Some students also like set up a little scene <laughs> um, and like put themselves in the scene. Those are totally fine, however they want to do it. But the idea is you're making some type of visual representation of the issue that you were talking about. Um, so this one here is one of the students' photos um, that was originally about the issue uh, transportation and trucks creating pollution in their neighborhood. Um, so students went away, they took pictures. Uh, it was lunch after that. So at lunch I printed out the photo so we were able to have like a hard copy of the picture printed out for people to look at. Um, and what we did is sit back around the table with nothing on the table and one at a time um, brought out the image and asked people what they saw. And so the person who took the picture um, didn't speak at first. So it wasn't like they introduced what, like this is a picture and it represents this. Um, it was more so like this picture represents a food issue. What's the issue? Um, and so what was really interesting is that sometimes uh, people came up with the same issue as the photographer, but sometimes they thought of something totally different. Mm -hmm. So do you remember our conversation about this one? Um. <laughs> I think it was more than just pollution. I think it was about being able to transfer food from far places. Yeah, and like import? Yeah. And yeah. places that aren't able to access food as easily as we are in the city. Yep. Then the other thing, like, like you'd think, okay, it's about a truck, it's about transportation. Mm -hmm. That's pretty clear. Um, but uh, the one that came up right away was someone was like, look at that. Um, like disability spot mm -hmm. um, for that's supposed to be for someone who needs accessibility uh, it's covered in snow <laughs> and they can't get to the door um, and prior to our to looking at this photo we hadn't put um, like we hadn't put accessibility on our list of issues um, and so looking at taking an issue from our community creating a representation of it and then re-looking at it like so basically you're rereading the issue um, we came up with more issues that are still of our community and from our community. Um, so a few more, I think we have a few more examples. Yeah, so in this one, 
Um, this one was taken with a cell, uh, like a <laughs> really bad cell phone. <laughs> so sorry, the picture is not really big or clear. But um, when we presented this picture, um, there was a lot of dialogue because do you, would you remember what this picture is of? Yeah, so this picture is a store down the road. Um, technically, I guess there's a deal on you get a basket for a dollar. But the problem with the picture, which you can't really see, was that even though you're getting a basket for a dollar, the produce isn't fresh. It was rotten and there were flies around it. So it's not really edible for you to eat or healthy for you to eat. But it's the cheapest thing rather than going to a big main store. Yeah. So this, like, I think the original issue that the students had picked was that, um, food wasn't affordable so they were trying to represent the issue of like cost in food but it opened up a whole conversation around quality of food and where is the best quality and do we see grocery stores that have food that's going to waste in every community um a lot of people said it was good that this food was not just going into the garbage but then people also said well how come only some neighborhoods get the low quality food and who lives in those places and do they also have access to high quality food started to reveal like all kinds of layers about income and poverty and race and like export and global corporations <laughs> and small business um and really it was just a picture of like a store down the road but we, we were able to start to um, reveal a lot of these issues that didn't come up when we first just posed a question we needed like an extra tool um, this other one here uh, is another one that we found was super interesting because, um, like, I imagine if you're watching this right now, you know exactly where this picture is from. <laughs> and one thing the students pointed out, um, originally they were talking about how it's uh, kind of junk food, like it's all sugar and starch, um, and there's nothing fresh and, and I did of what's available. Um, but nowhere on here does it say Tim Hortons, but everyone was like, oh, Tim Hortons. And so we had this conversation about like, how do you know that this is Tim Hortons? Like, what is the branding? What is the marketing? Um, and then we also, I remember Callie, you talking about like, why you like Tim Hortons so much, even though you don't like Tim Hortons. <laughs> like it just sucks you in, right? Yeah. Like, because you just of the marketing and, and all kinds of things. So we talked about flavor and sugar and additives. Um, and so it just like opened up a lot of conversation. So um, then, so here's kind of all kinds of pictures that were taken. Um, a package of bacon opened up a conversation around whether there was halal options. Um, people were talking about this um, pizza pizza slice combo, like when things are sold together to make it seem like a deal. Um, someone took a picture of his house to represent like mortgages and housing costs. So. Um, then what we did is we would write down all those new ideas. Um, so here are some additional themes that people were writing down that came from reading the pictures. Um, so here are some of the new ones that we talked about, like having halal options, accessibility, having big corporations and if money leaves the community or stays in the community. Um, and then what we did is we took everything off the table again. Um, and we started to read the cards one at a time. And as we read them, we decided whether they should be grouped or separate. And eventually we had grouped all of them together as like a theme. Uh, and then we would look at one group at a time and give it a name. Um, so for this example, they did organic, like don't have the option of organic, not accessible, junk foods more accessible, no grocery store close by, farmer's markets are hard to get to. So all of those were grouped together. And the students decided that they were the thing that linked them together was the issue of accessibility. And then we said, group, is there anything missing? Um, and Callie added uh, um, talking about vegan and vegetarian diets and making sure that people had access to food that was important to them in that way. Um, and then that became a workshop <laughs> um, and a curriculum expectation. So when you download our school grown curriculum in our food justice curriculum, one of the learning objectives is to understand accessibility, that by the time students finish at School Grown, they should know about food deserts and what it's like to live in a neighborhood with no grocery store. Um, important to consider people's food allergies, why it's important to make sure people have the food they need, like halal or kosher. So this all came from the students um, and was written by the students um, and comes 
from the issues that they face every day or that they see in their school or as Callie said, they see in their family um, or they see in other neighborhoods, like that, that type of thing. So um, what we have now is um, a full curriculum um, that we'll have up on our website as of today, <laughs> so you can download it. Um, but one thing we did recently is uh, we took all of our, some of the students who wrote, our leadership students, um, to Montreal to talk about their work. So Callie, do you want to talk about that? Uh, so we went to Montreal for the weekend to do a couple of conferences with a bunch of amazing people. Of course, we learned a lot and we got to learn about how other people run systems and how other schools around Canada um, run their lunch programs and things like that. Um, There's a picture of, yeah, so this is us. And tell them that we're doing. So um, in this picture, we are writing for our conference meeting. We had more of a hands-on one. Um, so we planned a, a workshop that had like some activities. And then we grabbed like someone was tweeting about our <laughs> PowerPoint, and that made us excited. So we put that in too. Um, but the idea is um, if we're going to value youth voices like from this other slide, um, one key thing that we that guides our decisions, including writing curriculum, um, is this idea of know about us without us. So if you're going to talk about young people, um, you need to have young people there, and you need to center their voices. And that goes for any community that you're working with or working in. Um, that what are the ways that you can um, not just like uh, include with air quotes, like on a basic level, but like how can you really center? Um, people in your work. So, um, some time for questions. I see there's a few questions on the side. That's great. Um, I'm going to close this document, I think, so you can see our faces. <laughs> um, but just a reminder, you can use the Q&A function, or, or you can email um, Sophia, and he'll post a question, or you can also tweet. Um, okay, stop. Back. Just a minute. Hey, <laughs> there we are. Okay, um, so we had um, a question here. I may have missed it, but what, uh, was the curriculum written before or after the first summer of farming? If after, how did you manage uh, the program leading up to that point? Um, so the curriculum was written after we had started. Um, in the first year, we kind of just went off of what we thought was important. <laughs> um, and also a mix of what students were asking for. So if we were working outside and students had asked, um, what's that bug? And then you would start a conversation about like, that's an aphid, or aphid's bad. Well, yeah, aphids kind of suck <laughs> um, in terms of farming, but ladybugs eat aphids. And so then we would do a workshop on pest management. Um, and I think that there's a lot of value in doing what emerges from the work, like when people have questions about what's going on, but um, risks centering only some voices or the centering only what the staff think is important because they might dismiss some things and not address them in the way that they address other things. Um, and also it provides some stability when you have new staff. So written down that says, at School Grown you learn this. Um, has been nice to be able to give a new staff person like this is what you learn here. <laughs> um, so we're not always like flying all the time. And we still do um, a lot of stuff based on what the students want to do. Like yeah. if they have questions about something or are interested in something, then we'll bring that in. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that answers your question. I think there's one more here, but it might just be a, oh yeah, how do you manage the program? So that's how we manage the program. So, uh, Kelly, what do you think? What do you want to tell the people about curriculum? <laughs> um, <laughs> or about school grown? I think um, it's a pretty awesome program to be a part of. Um, it's always good to come down and check it out and see if you like it, including if you're with, are still in the TDSB. Um, it's always nice to try and contact Katie because she gives you a lot of options and she helps you out a lot. 
So, yeah, that's nice. Um, so you can go to our website, foodshare.net um, slash schoolgrown, and we'll have this curriculum document. Um, but then soon, it's not. It, it's going up today. <laughs> um, we'll also have a recording of this webinar if you want to share it with people. And then we will also have, we have three more sessions coming up. So we're going to talk about how we do our crop plan, um, how we sell at farmer's markets. Um, Callie runs our markets. She's really good. And what's the last one? Oh, how we did crowdfunding. So how we were able to raise money through like a social media kind of crowdfunding campaign. Um, and each one of those will come with resources as well. Um, and we want to say thanks um, also to the people who allow us to do this. So our partners like the TDSB, um, but then also our funders, because that's really important. So the Counseling Foundation of Canada and Laidlaw Foundation have been two really great investors in our work. Um, and we really appreciate what they've done for us. Um, and also, I will plug the Great Big Crunch. So if you are working in a school or with young people um, or you work in local food, um, anyone can crunch. It's March 10th, 2.30 Eastern Standard Time, and everyone eats an apple at the same time. Um, and you can get more information at foodshare.net. And if questions come to you uh, later or um, if you are considering doing something similar and you have more detailed questions, um, you can send me an email. Uh, KDG at foodshare.net. Is that it? Yeah. That's it. <laughs> okay, thanks for joining us. It was fun. Okay, bye.